All right, class, so thanks for joining us. This is Wednesday, February 9th. I posted an announcement just a couple minutes ago, kind of outlining some of our um, kind of scheduling for the next couple of weeks. I wanna get us back on track. We were one behind in our syllabus schedule, but I think within the next couple of days, we'll get back on track. So I just wanted to kind of show you what really the next almost three weeks looks like because we have a lot of exams coming up, both in lecture and lab, and then we have a Monday off for President's Day in a couple of weeks. So um, just really simply, I kind of listed off the bulleted points. Today in lecture, we'll go through chapter five, your integumentary system, which we've covered in lab a little bit already. And then if you're in section two today, you will have your lab exam one on exercises one to five. That's worth 50 points. It's all labeling pictures, some content-based questions. And again, a lot of those pictures are taken from your lab manual and those virtual lab exercises. Also in lab uh, today, we will, I'll be lecturing a little bit and then you'll have two lab activities to do. So what I might do in lab today uh, and in lab on Monday, because on Monday you guys will have the same thing is I'm going to lecture on the skeletal system first, and then kind of give you your lab exam link and your lab activity links, and then let you guys work through those. Um, so we'll make sure you have plenty of time to do everything today, but today uh, and Monday will kind of be a big day in lab. So just keep that in mind. And then on Monday, um, we're gonna try to get through all of chapter six, your skeletal system, um, so that on Wednesday, we can be back on track on your um, syllabus schedule with the next lecture exam being lecture exam two on chapters five and six, which will just be a lecture exam on the integumentary and the skeletal system. So the only two chapters that we're going to cover in the next couple of days. Um, and then Wednesday, um, we're just, I'm gonna cancel lab for you guys because it's just a lab review period. So um, a week from today on Wednesday, you guys won't have lab. Um, because then on Monday, you know, because we're kind of always off because there's all these Mondays off, which is really nice for you. So Monday, we're, you're, you know, you have the whole day off, no lecture, no lab, and then Wednesday we'll be back on track, which will be the 23rd. So just keep your kind of mind um, aware of the exams coming up, um, especially if you're in section two, you're that lab exam today. All right, and if you have any questions, you can ask me at the end, but if not, I think I'm gonna jump right into our lecture. Um, chapter five is a tegumentary, um, and we might start a little bit of skeletal system today too, but let's start with chapter five, integumentary system. Um, this is a shorter lecture, and again, we kind of went over a little bit of this in lab already. So your integumentary system, um, again, consists of your skin, and all of the accessory structures that are a part of your skin, like your hair, your glands, and nails. And integument, that word literally means covering, and the appearance of the integumentary system can indicate physiological imbalances in the body. So your integumentary system is really kind of the first thing that ER professionals will look at. If you walk into the emergency room, they're gonna see if you're blue, if you're pale or gray, if you're red. So your integumentary system can tell doctors right away kind of what's what might be going on underneath. And we'll talk about what that might mean a little bit. So these are the layers of your integumentary system, which we went over in lab and we'll go over here even more. We talked about uh, your epidermis is the most superficial layer of the uh, integumentary system. And it's a very thin layer of all of those actively dividing skin cells at the bottom. And then towards the top, we have either alive or dead skin cells, depending on where you are in the body. And then the dermis is kind of the thicker layer underneath the epidermis. Um, that includes all of our glands, our hair follicles, blood vessels. And then the subcutaneous tissue or subcutaneous layer, also known as the hypodermis, this layer, again, is not technically a part of your integument, but we always include it um, in models because it just kind of nicely shows that nice adipose tissue layer that insulates um, kind of everyone underneath their dermis layer. So this adipose tissue layer is your hypodermis layer, and that's just the insulating fat layer that we all have. Um, some things in the dermis, we have sebaceous glands, which I uh, described as always being associated with a hair follicle. You'll see erector pili muscles, which are smooth muscles that help your hair stand erect when you get goosebumps. 
The hair follicle is the wall, um, kind of the boundary surrounding the hair root itself. Um, the hairs or the hair shafts will stick up above the layer of the skin. We have lots of different nerves and we'll talk about those lots of nerve endings in your skin because again, your skin is kind of your body's um, way to experience and be prepared for any external stimuli. So we have lots of different nerves to help you perceive what is going on around you, whether that's pain, temperature changes, touches. Um, so the lots of nerves um, in the dermis layer of your skin, veins and arteries, and then you'll have sweat glands, um, which secrete sweat, which is a little bit more watery-like substance to help you cool off. So you'll always see ducts from sweat glands um, being released to the surface area of the skin because as they release sweat, that helps to cool down your skin and your body temperature. So that's kind of what we're going over in this chapter. Um, functions of your integumentary system. Um, the big one is protection. Your skin uh, provides protection against abrasion and protection against ultraviolet light. And we'll talk about skin cancer later too and how we can protect ourselves from that. The big thing is to probably just stay out of the sun. That's a big one. Um, also, you know, your skin is your first line of defense. If you get into an accident, um, if you accidentally run into, you know, if you slam your knee against your desk, um, your skin is kind of, it's just, it's kind of your first defense against any sort of abrasion um, or uh, uh, hitting up against something. Sensation, your integumentary system has tons of sensory receptors to help your body detect heat, cold, touch, pressure, pressure, and pain um, to try to all keep things at an equilibrium inside the body. And then vitamin D production, when your skin is produced uh, to ultraviolet light, it produces a molecule that can be transformed into vitamin D, which is important. Temperature regulation, um, the amount of blood flow beneath your skin surface, and the activity of your sweat glands are both controlled to help regulate your body temperature. So more blood will travel to your skin um, to try to dissipate the heat, spread it out to cool you down. And then your sweat gland activity will be increased to try to get rid of sweat because when your body releases that watery sweat, it releases heat to try to cool you down. And then excretion, a very small amount of waste product is lost through the skin and in gland secretions. When we think about ways that your body excretes wastes, most of it is excreted through your urinary system or your digestive system, but a little bit will be secreted as waste uh, through your sweat. So here we have your skin made up of those two main tissue layers, the epidermis and the dermis. Um, that prefix epi means above. So the epidermis is the most superficial layer of the skin. It will rest on top of the dermis and the dermis is your layer of dense connective tissue. Remember your epidermis is made up of epithelial tissue. So it's only cells, no blood vessels. And then the dermis is the dense connective tissue which contains all of your hair follicles, erective pili muscles, blood vessels, and so forth. And then the skin um, rests on that subcutaneous tissue layer, which is a layer of adipose tissue below the dermis, and that layer is not a part of your skin. We just include it in our um, models. So here we have you know, how your epidermis and your um, dermis kind of interlock together. And these bumps coming up from the dermis are called dermal papilla and they will be what give you the um, friction ridges or fingerprints that you can see and what you get fingerprinted for before starting a new job or for other reasons. Um, so the dermal papilla kind of interlock with the epidermis and those dermal papilla you can actually see um, as the, your fingerprints. Here's a um, look at a microscopic view of the dermis and then some of the layers of the epidermis here, the basale, some intermediate layers, and then the stratum corneum, which is the most superficial layer of your epidermis. So the epidermis specifically prevents water loss um, and resists abrasion. The epidermis, known as your cutaneous membrane, is a layer of that stratified, keratinized squamous epithelium. And remember that keratinized layer are all those dead skin cells filled with keratin, which is that protein to help prevent against water loss. And your epidermis is composed of those distinct layers, which we call strata. There's five layers if you are in thick skin and only four layers if you're in thin skin. 
So we'll start kind of with the most superficial layer, the stratum corneum. That's the most superficial layer of your epidermis um, consisting of those dead squamous cells filled with keratin. And again, keratin is that really nice protein to give um, structural strength to this layer, but as well as um, protecting against water loss. Uh, cells of your deepest strata in the epidermis will perform the mitosis or the actively dividing cells and forming of new cells. And then as the new cells form, they will push the older cells to the surface where hundreds, thousands are being sloughed and flaked off within this hour long lecture. Excessive sloughing of the stratum can lead to dandruff. So excessive sloughing off of those stratum corneum cells um, from your scalp, for example, is called dandruff. And in skin subjected to a lot of friction, so let's say you play the guitar or are learning how to play the guitar, or let's say you're starting to rock climb or doing some other activity where um, any type of physical labor where you're using your hands a lot, uh, the number of layers in your stratum corneum can increase, producing a thickened area called a callus. And over a bony prominence, the stratum corneum can thicken to form a cone-shaped structure called a cone. And that's what you can sometimes get on your feet, the cones that appear on the medial side of your big toes. Then the dermis layer, again, is composed of a dense collagenous connective tissue containing lots of different cells. Fibroblasts, adipocytes, macrophages will have nerves, hair follicles, those smooth muscle, erector pili muscles, different glands, lymphatic vessels that are extending throughout the dermis. Um, you'll have a lot of collagen fibers oriented in many different directions and elastic fibers. And this is um, to help give the dermis some structural support and also help to make the dermis resistance to stretch. So if you know if you lift up your skin, it'll snap back into place. And that's due to these elastic and collagen fibers giving strength, structural support, and being able of your dermis to kind of go back to the initial shape. Um, this is an interesting point about your dermis. Some of your collagen fibers are oriented more in more directions than others, forming what we call cleavage lines. And the name does not necessarily reflect what you're referring to. Um, cleavage lines in the dermis are the tension lines in the skin that are more resistant to stretch. So these are the orientation of your collagen fibers in the dermis layer. And physicians, especially surgeons, know where these cleavage lines are located um, because they will make incisions parallel to these lines because that will tend to gap less and produce less scar tissue in the healing process. Um, and if your skin is overstretched for any reason, like in pregnancy or um, let's say you were overweight and you lost a bunch of weight, you still might have stretch marks. And those stre stretch marks are formed from when the dermis is damaged by being overstretched. So here is a look at how these cleavage lines or these bundles of collagen fibers are oriented throughout the dermis of the skin. Um, and let's look at an incision made parallel or kind of in the same direction as these bundles of collagen fibers. You can see if you make an inc incision parallel to those collagen fiber bundles, um, when they go back to stitch you up, it, there's not as much of a gap because there's no tension kind of pulling away from that initial incision. However, if you make an incision kind of across the cleavage lines, you can see how the tension due to those collagen fibers will naturally pull in the you know, perpendicular or opposite direction from that incision line. So it'll take more time for this incision to heal and probably leave more scar tissue formation. So those are cleavage lines, the, um, the direction of those parallel bundles of collagen. The more about the dermis, the dermal papilla were those bumps. They are the projections toward the epidermis found in the upper part of the dermis. Uh, the dermal papilla will contain blood vessels um, they, the dermal papilla, specifically in the palms of your hands, the soles of your feet, the tips of your digits are arranged in parallel curving ridges that shape the overlying epidermis into fingerprints and footprints or friction ridges. And that's what um, everyone has unique fingerprints. And that's why it makes it a good way to identify people, good way to identify bodies um, and people if anyone needs to know anything about your past for hiring you, for example. 
Skin color, so this is also an interesting note. Um, factors that determine skin color include different pigments, which give the skin its color. Um, also, skin color can be determined by how much blood is circulating through the skin. Let's say you get embarrassed or are nervous, blood rushes to your skin and you get more red, um, as well as the thickness of your stratum cornea. That outermost layer can determine skin color. And the two primary pigments to determine skin color are melanin and carotene. Melanin is just a group of pigments primarily responsible for your skin, your hair, and your eye color. And then carotene is a specific yellow pigment found in plants such as squash and carrots. Um, so babies, if they eat a lot of this carotene pigment, if they eat a lot of carrots, a lot of squash, um, the tips of their um, noses will turn orange. Obviously that color will go away, but this can affect, um, you know, if you eat too much of a certain food, like in babies, usually you feed babies a lot of mashed carrots or squash, their um, noses might turn a little orange or yellow. Uh, so most melan melanin molecules are brown to black pig pigments, but some are yellowish or reddish. So again, this is melanin, it's kind of this group of colored pigments that determine skin color. And what melanin does is it provides protection against UV light from the sun. Um, melanin is produced by melanocytes, which are a cell in um, the basal layer of your epidermis. And the melanin will be packaged into vesicles called melanosomes, which move into the cell processes of melanocytes. Um, epithelial cells will bite off or phagocytize the tips of that melanocyte um, thereby acquiring more melanosomes. And melanin, um, so if you are exposed to a lot of sunlight, melanin will be produced um, and that turns your skin a darker color or gives you a skin, um, a suntan. Um, but melanin will be produced as a way for your skin to protect itself against UV rays, but it has a darker color. So that gives you a suntan. Also um, kind of pockets of melanin throughout your body are freckles or moles where there's just was a lot of uh, melanin produced in that particular area. Um, the amount of freckles and moles you have is usually a genetic, something that's passed on. So here's how melanin is transferred to your epithelial cells. Again, melanin is produced by melanocytes in kind of the basal layer of your epidermis. So here we have melanocytes producing the melanosomes, and then you have other cells kind of biting them off to um, take in that melanin. You don't necessarily need to know all these steps, um, but just know that melanin is produced um, by these melanocyte cells uh, in a response to UV light rays to try to protect your skin cells. So then skin color itself. So like I mentioned before, large amounts of melanin can form your freckles or your moles. Um, and that's why freckles will come out in the sun because UV light rays promote the production of melanin. So my daughter has red hair and freckles. Um, and when she goes out in the sun, sun, she just, her face fills up with all of these freckles. Melanin production, again, is determined by genetic factors. So the amount of freckles or moles you have usually gets passed down. Um, exposure to light, UV light rays produce more melanin, as well as hormones. Hormones can um, in, um, affect the production of melanin. Um, and genetic factors are responsible for the amounts of melanin produced in different races. So um, if we talk about skin color across races, all races have about the same number of melanocytes, but the differences in skin color are usually determined by the amount, the kind, and the distribution of melanin. Because remember, we talked about melanin as kind of this group of skin pigments. So the kind of the proportion of which type of pigment we're talking about, the amount, the kind, how it's distributed, that's all determined genetically, but that also will lead um, to the different just racial variations in skin color, for example. Uh, exposure to ultraviolet light, for example, in your sunlight stimulates melanocytes to increase melanin production, and this gives you a suntan. Um, many genes are responsible for skin color, but one single mutation, which means a mutation uh, when the DNA is copied by one single base pair, can prevent the production of melanin altogether, and that causes albinism, which would be um, completely white skin, but also white irises, because remember, melanin gives you the color of your eyes, 
So um, albinism or albino people would be completely white, completely white eyes uh, due to one single mutation in their DNA, which is interesting. Uh, carotene um, is uh, what I talked about. If you consume a lot of it, especially in babies, the skin can become yellow. It's a lipid soluble. And once when consumed, it can accumulate in the lipids of the stratocorneum. So because it can be dissolved in lipids, it can accumulate that on the surface of your epidermis. And if you eat too much of it, such as in carrots or squash, your um, skin can become quite yellowish. Uh, then the skin color can also be determined by um, the color of your blood or the amount of blood traveling to the surface of your skin. So for example, if you have a decrease in blood flow, like in shock, or if someone faints, it can make the skin appear very pale or gray or ashen, we say. If you have a decrease in blood oxygen levels, uh, this can produce a blue color to your skin. We call that cyanosis. Um, so again, this is how your skin color can be a very helpful diagnostic tool. If you walk into your ER or if you're working in the ER and someone looks really pale or gray, you know that they're not getting a lot of blood flow to their skin, so they might be in shock or they might be about to faint. And if they look blue in color, that means that there's not enough oxygen content in their skin, and that is called a cyanosis. And then the subcutaneous layer rests on, or the skin itself rests on the subcutaneous tissue, which is not a part of your skin. It's also called the hypodermis. What the subcutaneous tissue does is it attaches the skin layers above it, epidermis and dermis, to the underlying bone and muscle tissue itself. And it also plies it with blood vessels and nerves. Um, it is a looser connected tissue, includes a lot of adipose fatty tissue um, that contains about half of your body's stored lipids. So it's where your stored lipids reside and it will kind of help to insulate and protect um, kind of the layer of skin. The amount and location of your adipose tissue can vary with your age, with your sex, and with your diet. As we all know, adipose tissue and the subcutaneous tissue can function as padding and insulation, and the subcutaneous tissue can be used to estimate total body fat. So that's why if you ever go to a nutritionist, they'll measure your subcutaneous layer, layer um, by estimating your percentage of body fat. Um, females usually have a little more body fat than males, about 21 to 30%. Um, just due to the fact that their bodies are kind of made for potentially carrying an offspring. Um, and males have a little bit less, about 13 to 25%. So that kind of takes us through the skin and then the hair. So in humans, hair is found everywhere on the skin, parts of your genitalia, palms, soles, lips, and also distal segments of the fingers and toes, unless you try to get rid of it. Um, each hair arises from a hair follicle, which is a deep invagination of your epidermis that extends deep into the dermis. The hair shaft is the part of the hair that is above the surface of the skin, and the root part of the hair is below the surface, and the hair bulb is the expanded base of the root. A hair has a hard cortex, which is always the outer layer, um, which surrounds the softer medulla center. The cortex is covered by a cuticle, which is a single layer of overlapping cells that holds the hair in the hair follicle. Hair is produced by actively dividing uh, cells in the hair bulb, which rests on your hair papilla. And your hair papilla is an extension of the dermis that protrude, protrudes into the hair bulb and contains all the blood vessels of the hair. Um, hair is produced in cycles with a growth stage and a resting stage, depending on how old you are. During the growth stage, hair will be formed by those actively dividing cells, mitosis of epithelial cells. These cells will divide and undergo keratinization where they'll become harder and thicker. And then during the resting stage of hair growth, the growth will stop and the hair is just held within that hair follicle and different hairs throughout the body grow in different, um, it takes longer for some hairs to grow than others. And when the next growth stage begins, a new hair is usually formed and the old hair will fall out. Different hor you know, hormone levels can affect hair growth, hair loss, um, where the hair is located on your body. So the duration of each stage of a hair depends on the, the individual hair, where it's located, and any sort of hormones that might be going through your body at the time. 
So for example, eyelashes grow for about 30 days and rest for 105 days, which is, I mean, what, more than three months? Whereas your scalp hairs grow for three years and rest for one to two years. And the loss of hair normally means that the hair is being replaced because an old hair will fall out of the hair follicle when new hair begins to grow. So that's a little bit about hair. Um, just like how melanin determines skin color, eye color, um, the varying amounts of melanin also determine your hair color. And as we get older, the amount of melanin in your hair will decrease and that causes your hair to become faded. And if it contains no melanin at all, your hair will become white. My dad, I think, went completely white when he was like 40. So again, it just depends on the person when you get gray hairs or not. Um, each hair follicle is attached to a smooth muscle cell. These are your erector pili muscles. So these are smooth muscles. They are under involuntary control. So they'll contract without you telling them to. Um, but when they do contract, they cause the hair to become perpendicular on the skin surface or make the hair stand erect. So here's a look at the anatomy of the hair and hair follicle, a little more detail um, than what we went over in lab, but you see the hair follicle wall, you see the hair bulb, which is the base of the hair root. And this is where you'll have your actively dividing cells. You could see the artery um, and vein bringing blood supply, the hair bulb, the site of cellular divisions that will then push those hairs up to the surface. Here we have melanocytes to help give the hair its color. And then again, the hair shaft protrudes above the skin surface and the hair root um, is below the surface of the skin. And again, you'll always see the erector pili muscle associated with the hair at the hair root level. And you'll always see sebaceous glands um, associated with the hair below the surface of the skin. And we'll talk about what those are now. So the major glands of your skin will have sebaceous glands and we will have sweat glands. Sebaceous glands are the simple branched acinar glands. They are connected always by a duct to the superficial part of the hair follicle and they produce sebum, which is an oily substance, rich in lipids. Um, it's released by what we call holocrine secretion. It helps to lubricate the hair as well as the surface of your skin to help prevent drying out of the hair in your skin, but it also helps to protect against some types of bacteria. So that's what sebaceous glands are for. And then we have two types of sweat glands. So these are sweat glands. They produce the sweat watery substance. We have eccrine and apocrine sweat glands. Eccrine sweat glands are simple coiled tubular glands um, releasing their sweat by merocrine secretion. Eccrine sweat glands are located in every part of the skin, but they're very numerous in the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. And again, eccrine sweat glands produce a secretion that's mostly water with just a few salts um, that will be released as a waste product. Um, eccrine sweat glands will always have ducts that open onto the surface of your skin uh, through sweat pores and they will be for thermal regulation. So the release of sweat will help to cool down your body. Sweat can also be released, um, can also be released in the palms, soles and your armpits and other places, not just to help you regulate temperature, but also if you're under emotional stress, if you're really nervous, your armpits get sweaty. Um, so any emotional stress could also cause um, sweat gland secretion. And then the other type of sweat gland found in your skin, these are apocrine sweat glands. They're simple coiled tubular glands. Uh, your apocrine sweat glands produce a secretion that's a little rich, more rich in organic substances. So these um, will be found in the armpits, your genitalia, and they will be, these are the ones that become active at puberty because they're under influence of those sex hormones. So when puberty hits, these uh, sweat glands become active. Um, and what happens is their secretion is usually odorless, but when they're released, they quickly get broken down by a bacteria. And that is what gives the bodily odor to the, this sweat that is secreted by apocrine sweat glands. So here we have the glands in the skin. Um, the apocrine sweat glands are what, what you'll have in your um, armpits, your genitalia. Um, they'll be released and they'll turn into kind of an odor because of the bacteria that breaks them down. And the eccrine sweat glands will be more numerous in other parts of the body. Those are released to help you thermally 
thermally regulate your body temperature, emotional situations, and their secretion is just more watery. And then again, you'll always find the sebaceous gland producing the sebum, but it's always attached and associated with the hair follicle itself. So those are some of the glands of the skin. Then we'll jump right into nails. So again, we're just gonna kind of push our way through this. Nails, um, a nail itself is a thin plate consisting of layers of dead stratocordium cells that contain a very hard type of keratin. And that's what gives your nails a harder kind of to touch to them. The visible part of the nail is called the nail body. Um, the part you can paint if you want. And the part of the nail covered by the skin is the nail root. And the cuticle or the eponychium is the stratum corneum that extends into the nail body and the nail root. Um, and the nail root will extend distally from the nail matrix. So I'll show you a picture of this um, on our next slide. Um, the nail is also attached to the underlying nail bed, which is located distal to the nail matrix. And the nail matrix and bed are just epithelial tissue with the basal stratum that gives rise to cells that form the hard nail itself. Um, you can see the lunula as part of the nail matrix. It's that whitish crescent shaped area um, found at the base of the nail and cell production within the, the, within the nail matrix causes the nail to grow continuously and get pushed out. Um, so again, cell production always occurs within the nail matrix. So let's show you a picture of a nail shown here. Here we have the lunula, kind of that lunar um, moon shaped structure, the free edge, uh, the nail body, the nail root, and then the cuticle. And then if we look at a sagittal view, we can kind of see how where the nail matrix is underneath the surface of the skin, the nail root underneath the skin, and how actively dividing nail cells will kind of be pushed out um, and constantly growing through the nail body. Nails are important um, um, for different reasons for, um, to help this, um, the biggest one they even say is just for defense purposes, you know, why our bodies were made with nails, even self-defense purposes, um, and just a way to protect the kind of the top part of your fingers. Uh, so in your integumentary system protection, it performs many protective functions in general um, to try to reduce the amount of body water loss by that keratin in your epidermis cells. It also acts as a barrier that prevents microorganisms and other foreign substances from entering the body. Um, your integumentary system protects underlying structures against abrasion, and melanin specifically absorbs ultraviolet light to protect underlying structures from its damaging effects. Hair production, hair protection, so hair acts as a heat insulator. Your eyebrows keep sweat out of your eyes. Eyelashes quickly close to try to keep things out of your eyes from anything foreign that's flying around. And you also have very much needed hair in your nose and your ears, which no one likes to see, but it's also very important. The hair in your nose and ears prevents entry of dust, um, as well as other materials into those very kind of um, just special areas. You don't want a lot of stuff getting into your nose or getting into your ears. And again, the nails protect the ends of your fingers and toes from damage and can be used in self-defense. So we'll, we're working our way through. We'll talk a lot about your sensory receptors now. So these are, again, very important to your skin because your sensory receptors in your skin in the epidermis and dermis can help to detect pain, heat, cold, and pressure as a way for your body to experience and kind of perceive what's going on around it. Although the hair itself does not have a nerve supply, you will always have sensory receptors around the hair follicle and that can detect the movement of the hair as well. Vitamin D production. So UV light, like we talked about before, causes the skin to produce a precursor molecule of vitamin D. And this precursor molecule is carried by the blood to the liver where it's converted by an enzyme. Um, the enzymatically then converted molecule is carried by the blood to the kidneys where it's converted again to the active form of vitamin D. So um, think of your UV light. So being out in the sun is important because UV light causes your skin to produce kind of a precursor molecule that will eventually be converted into vitamin D, but that occurs in your kidneys. So the conversion 
of that molecule that UV light produces gets converted to vitamin D in your kidneys. And vitamin D is needed and important because vitamin D tells your small intestines to absorb calcium and phosphate, which are important for a lot of different bodily functions. Calcium for muscle contraction, phosphate is an inorganic substance that um, helps give your uh, bones strength. So that's why vitamin D, how it's produced by being out in the sun, but also why it's important. You need vitamin D because it helps your small intestines absorb calcium and phosphate. Regulation of body temperature we talked about is very important um, because of homeostasis, chemical reactions within your body can be increased or decreased by changes in body temperature. And even a very slight change in temperature can make an enzyme in your body, for example, operate less efficiently and a, a change in body temperature can disrupt normal rates of chemical changes in the body. So um, exercise, fever, and any increase in environmental temperature tend to raise your body temperature. And whenever you get a raise in body temperature, your body must get rid of that excess heat. And it does that in two ways. Your blood vessels in the dermis will dilate or become larger and that enables more blood to flow within the skin. And that just causes heat to dissipate or spread out from the body. So if you spread out the heat, that'll dissipate and cool your body down. And then sweat also assists in the loss of heat because as you release sweat, you're releasing that heat in the form of that sweat. So that will help um, cool your body through evaporative cooling. Um, and then in the opposite way, if body temperature begins to drop below normal, um, so if you're in negative 40 degree northern Minnesota winters, uh, heat can be conserved by constricting dermal blood vessels, which reduces blood flow to the skin. So less heat is transferred from the deeper structures to the skin, so heat loss is reduced. And that is why your body's trying to retain your body heat and blood moving to your essential organs. So that's why in extreme cold, the tips of your fingers, the tips of your nose, and the tips of your toes will go through frostbite first because your body is um, not flowing as much blood to those parts. With smaller amounts of warm blood flowing through the skin, the skin temperature will decrease. So here we have heat exchange in the skin just showing um, how heat loss across the epidermis increases when we dilate our blood vessels to the surface of the skin's surface to the skin and heat loss across the epidermis decreases when we constrict blood vessels. So we have little kind of smooth muscles here to control blood flow into our surface layer um, veins and arteries. And these smooth muscles can constrict or dilate to allow more blood flow to the surface of the skin to release heat or constrict blood flow to keep heat more in the center of the body. And that's how we can help to control um, heat exchange in the skin by our blood vessels. Uh, then excretion. And so, and I'm just gonna point out here, your integumentary system in general, it plays a very minor role in the excretion, the removal of waste products from the body. So you'll, you know, when you taste your sweat or, you know, if your sweat is falling into your mouth, it does taste kind of salty. Um, sweat can also contain very small amounts of waste products like urea, uric acid, and ammonia, but it plays a very small role in the excretion of those. Normally, urea, uric acid, and ammonia um, are secreted. One moment here. So sorry for that interruption, guys. Um, so in general, um, you know, things like urea, uric acid, and ammonia um, are only uh, released normally with your kidney and the urinary system through your urine, but your um, sweat can remove very small amounts of that as well. Uh, so the diagnostic aid, so this is, um, again, what we talked about, how your skin color can be used in diagnosing problems that could be happening underneath the skin. And I think you do have a test question on your next exam. And I'll try to, um, just remind me if I don't, but I'll try to post a list of study tips too before your next exam, things to help you study for. 
Um, but a couple of diagnostic tools, we talked about cyanosis being the bluish color to the skin caused by a decreased O2 content. And then jaundice can make your skin a more yellow color. And that can occur when your liver is damaged by a disease. So usually jaundice um, tells you that something's wrong with the liver, such as viral hepatitis, which is an inflammation of their liver. Hepa prefix always has to do with liver and viral due to some sort of virus. You can also have jaundice, um, kind of a yellowish color occurring um, in newborns who might need a little extra sunlight as well. Or just a rash or a lesion in the skin can be a symptom of a problem elsewhere in the body. You know, you can get rashes by if you're allergic to some sort of food you've eaten. So the skin is a, or your integumentary system in general is a very helpful diagnostic aid. Okay, and then we'll talk about burns. And a burn is injury to a tissue caused by heat, cold, friction, chemicals, electricity, or radiation. And burns are always classified according to their depth through the skin. Um, a partial thickness burn are classified as a first degree. So um, kind of just barely getting through the surface of the skin would be a first degree partial burn um, and second degree, those would be partial thickness burns. But a full thickness burn that gets through all layers of the skin is classified as a third degree burn. So for example, a first degree, so very superficial burn involves only your epidermis layer. It's usually red, painful, some swelling, which is edema, may be present. Um, this can be caused by sunburn or a brief exposure to a very hot or very cold objects. They usually heal without scarring in about a week. So that's a first degree burn. A second degree burn, also a partial thickness burn. It will usually get through both the epidermis and layers of your dermis. If the dermal damage is minimal, the symptoms might only be redness, pain, edema, which is again swelling and some blisters, and healing takes about two weeks with still no scarring. But if the burn goes deeper into the dermis, the wound can appear even more reddish, tannish, or whitish, and it can take several months to heal and might even scar. So I burned myself on my stove Christmas day, um, and I'm having a little scar here, so I'm hoping that goes away. But uh, those are second degree burns. And then third degree burns, these are the full thickness burns. They are going completely through the epidermis and the dermis. What's scary about third degree burns is they're usually painless because if you're getting through the dermis layer of the skin, that means you're destroying all the sensory receptors. So that's what's kind of hard to watch in third degree burn. Um, in general, you know, if you're ever, you got, some of you are EMTs, but if you ever come across a burn victim, it's probably one of the hardest things to see and not, I have no experience with this, but it's just what I've heard some people say um, because they're usually painless. So you'll see, you know, it'll get down to the muscle, the bone, all the sensory receptors will be destroyed. Um, you'll obviously have pain because not everywhere across the skin will be a third degree burn. Um, so, you know, areas where it's second or first degree, that's where it'll be really painful. They will appear white, tannish, brownish, black, or deep cherry red. Um, burn healing in all second degree burns, your epidermis, including, a, including your stratum basale, where the stem cells are found, are damaged. The epidermis can regenerate from epithelial tissue um, in your hair follicles and sweat glands, as well as from the edges around the wound. But deep partial thickness or full thickness burns will take a longer time to heal. They'll form scar tissue. Um, they might form with disfiguring and debilitating wound contractures as well. In order to treat burns, you know, if you do get a full degree, full thickness burn, um, a skin graft is an often performed in a procedure called a split skin graft. The epidermis and part of the dermis are removed from another part of the body to place over the burn. Um, and when it's not possible or practical to move skin from one part of the body to another, Physicians might use artificial skin or a graft from a human cadaver as well. So this just takes us through partial thickness burns, how far we would get, you know, first degree, second degree, and then third degree burns would be deepest through both your epidermis and dermis layers. Um, one thing about burns that um, I'm going to have you guys kind of look up at your own. This is a little kind of research assignment. You have to look into a little bit 
what we call the rule of nines. And the rule of nines, there will be one question on your exam about the rule of nines. And I'm going to have you guys research this on your own a little bit. The rule of nines refers to the idea that we've kind of divided um, the body into nine regions based on percentages. And physicians will use the rule of nines to determine how much or how high of a percentage a person's um, epidermis or dermis was burned and how they would because they would use that kind of percentage or percentage lost of skin to determine if they could take a skin graft from another area. So this is just um, kind of a shout out. You'll have a question on your test about the rule of nines and just do a little brief research on your own, kind of like a mini homework assignment as what the rule of nines is and how it relates to burns. So, and then we'll end with skin cancer. It's the most common cancer always mainly caused by UV light exposure. Fair skinned people like my redheaded daughter are more prone um, and it's prevented by not going out in the sun. That's the first thing. Just don't go in the sun as much as you can. Although you need to get vitamin D, you know, you need some sun exposure, but use sunscreen and use sunscreen every day. Uh, start getting into that habit every morning when you wake up, wash your face, just put on a sunscreen. It, you'll have less wrinkles later and you'll greatly reduce um, your possibilities of skin cancer. UVA light rays, for example, cause a tan, and that, those are associated with malignant melanomas. Those are cancerous. UVB rays cause sunburn, and sunscreen um, usually should block both types of rays. The different types of skin cancer, we have basal cell carcinoma, where the cells in your stratum basale are affected. This cancer is usually removed by surgery, squamous cell carcinoma, cells above the stratum basale layer are affected and this can cause death. And then malignant melanoma um, arises from melanocytes in a mole. It's a very rare type, but it can also cause death as well. And then I think we kind of end with a couple pictures of what these various types of skin cancer might look like. So going in order A, B, and C, A would be basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and then um, the malignant melanoma. So really anytime you see, and this is why dermatology is such a hot kind of medical um, area right now. So if you're interested in the skin, go into dermatology, but always keep an eye on your moles, different bumps on your skin that might form um, because there's a reason why a mole might change color, might change shape. So just keep an eye on that. And if one of your moles is changing shape or color, just set up an appointment with it with a dermatologist and they can take um, a sample of it. They'll measure it. They'll just, it's just always good to keep an eye on your moles and freckles, especially on your face and areas of high sun exposure. So aging and the integument, um, no problem, Wiley. I just got your message. Thanks for joining. Um, aging and the integument. So as we're going through the body systems now, we kind of end each chapter with how we're all aging and how our cells are dying, which is kind of hard to end the class this way. Um, but how does your integument system change as you age? Well, blood flow decreases, the skin becomes thinner due to decreased amounts of collagen, um, due to decreased activity of sebaceous and sweat glands. This makes temperature regulation more difficult. So usually elderly are, they are colder. So retire in a warm place like Southern California or Florida or Arizona. And then you lose a lot of elastic fibers, which can cause your skin to sag and wrinkle. And that takes us through the end of this chapter. I won't start um, the next chapter on the skeletal system, but just know that that'll be a pretty lengthy chapter that we want to get through for next week. I'm just going to... Um, pull up my most recent announcement at the end. So please take a look at this again. We're also gonna end you know, a little early because I'm gonna give section two lab people to study for their lab exam today. That'll be today on exercises one to five. Um, and uh, we'll also have lab activities. So you just have a big day in lab today. Um, lecture on Monday will be a big lecture getting through a long, it's not super long. It'll be on chapter six, your skeletal system and then lab um, one people have their lab exam with lab activities on Monday. Um, and then Wednesday, a week from today, we'll have your next lecture exam, which are just on these two chapters, chapters five and six. Um, and then I'll give you guys the, the next couple of days off in lab because Wednesday lab will just skip lab 
And then Monday, which is not for a while, but I just wanted to put this on your radar, that is President's Day. So you'll have off of Lecture Lab for that day. So please look at that most recent announcement. Um, otherwise, I will see you guys in lab today. I'm going to stop the recording, and then a couple of you were messaging me some questions. So I'll answer your questions.